Okay, while the kids are going back to their seats, I want to tell you a, a pretty quick story here. Um, I'm a member of Christian Motorcycles Association. We're a Christian motorcycle ministry. And we had an international rally. We have chapters all over the world. We had an international rally back in October. One of the ministry partners that we support uh, gave a report to us called the Jesus Film Project. And the Jesus Film Project takes, uh, they had made a film about the death, burial, the birth, death, burial, resurrection, the ministry, and the, the salvation that only Christ brings. And they translated into native dialect and, and native languages of uh, countries all over the world. There are thousands of different translations of this film. Currently, we're showing this film in 192 of 196 countries around the world. We've got a report back this past Ramadan, back in April, uh, which is a Muslim holiday. We had 177 people walking around the outside of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Now, non-Muslim people are not allowed inside Mecca. Mecca is the, the holy epicenter for the Muslim faith. 177 people were walking around the outside. They were praying and quoting scripture and praying scripture. And, and a man walked up to them and asked them what was going on, what they were doing. They had five safe houses set up around the outside of Mecca that was showing the Jesus film 24-7. They took him into one of the safe houses and, and showed him this Jesus film. He watched it back to back to back to back. It's two hours long. He converted to Christianity, made Jesus the Lord of his life right there after watching that film. Now, what's so special about some guy in Saudi Arabia that, it, that allowed Jesus to reign his life is this. This man was a direct descendant, hear me church, a direct descendant of the prophet Muhammad. Wait, it gets better. As a Christian, when you become a Christian in Saudi Arabia, you're automatically marked for death. So he goes home to protect his family and his children, and he locks himself in his bathroom for two and a half hours. His wife beating on the door, cleaning on him, what's going on? Why have you changed? What's up? He finally comes out and says, well, I've met Jesus, and I'm a Christian now, and it's because of this Jesus film. And she gets mad at him and says, why didn't you take me? <laughs> Day and night. So he arranges for his wife and his children to see the Jesus film, and his wife and his children are saved as well. A few days later, there's a knock on the door, and the neighbor next door says, you need to leave now. Your husband is hanging in the public square. So they get in an SUV, and they take off through the desert in the middle of the night. They go to a neighboring village and, and knock on the door of a wealthy businessman that this family knows. And he sees his wife and children in the middle of the night at his front door and realizes that there's no husband here. This is bad. I don't want to be having any part of this. So he sends them down the road. They go down the road to a mosque. And an imam lets them in and gives them safe passage for the night. The next morning before the sun rises and morning prayers begin, there's a knock on the door. This wealthy businessman's beating on the door of the mosque. i got to have my guest back. Give me my guest back. And the inman comes to the door and says, They're, you turn them away. They're not your guest anymore. He goes, no, I've got to have my guest back. And the inman says, you can't have them. He says, you don't understand. You see, last night I had a dream. And in this dream, I was visited by a man named Jesus. And he told me in my dream that whoever I deny on earth, that he would deny in heaven before the Father. And that woman knows who Jesus is. I need to know more about her. I need my guest back. And the Enemon says, you can't have them because you see, last night I had a dream. And this man named Jesus visited me in my dream. And he told me that whoever I deny on earth, he would deny in heaven. So they bring this woman out into the middle of a mosque in a desert in Saudi Arabia. And she shares with him Jesus. And an imam and a wealthy businessman become Christians. Now as the praise team comes back up here, as the band gets ready, I want to ask you a question. What chains is God breaking in your life? What chains is God releasing you from because a prophet is descendant of a Muslim faith was the reason that an inman and a and wealthy businessman are now praising the Lord. Amen. No matter how messy things can get, we can still be thankful, right? Amen. I'm uh, we're reminded of that we we've not I have a feeling after today we might want to that uh, you know you just
just get tired of leftovers after a while, don't you? Interesting, you know, you can have this grand meal on Thursday and then you get to share it again on Thursday night, and Friday, and Saturday, and probably some more today, and, and hopefully again tomorrow. And so we just continue on. But there's so, so very much to be thankful for. And, and uh, it, it's been a good week for us. My parents got to come down, and my sister and her family got to come, and we got to, to celebrate Thanksgiving with them in a very, very full house for us. And uh, so if that's you, and uh, you are now glad that family is is heading back to their own homes, right? And uh, leftovers are about gone, and family's about to be ready to get back into the, the normal routine of life. You know, Monday morning after Thanksgiving just kind of comes and just slaps you out of the face. Doesn't it? It's like, okay, you've had your time off, you've had your little time together, you've had all the food, yeah, it's time to get back to work. Oftentimes, I feel for me, it's easy to get thankful, and like Billy was talking about, it's easy to get very thankful on Thanksgiving Day, and there's that feeling in your heart that just is it's so grateful for what God has done, and you get to share it with friends and family and loved ones, and, and then real life heads and you get going right back into it and you go, man, what, what was I what was I thinking? What I, I, you know, there's just so much going on. There's there are gonna be deadlines tomorrow. You got bills to pay tomorrow. The relationship issues that you had and that you kind of so you kind of paused the war for a little bit for a couple of days to be thankful and then now you're right back into the difficulty again. How do we do that? How, how do we how do we be thankful in the midst of some really trying times? Like that. And a few years ago, about four years ago, we were celebrating our, uh, our Thanksgiving service over at the Civic Center. And uh, I remember we did that. We got both of our services together and, and we went over there. And I mentioned something to you on that day about the difference between being thankful and, and think less. And, and as I was reflecting on that this week, I wanted to, to share a few more things with you that I didn't get to share then. It's uh, you know, a short message over there in, in the middle of the Civic Center. It's very difficult to. To, to hear over there, but I, I wanted to, to take some things that I shared then and some new things that I, I, I'm just feeling compelled to share with you today to, to, to give you the, the difference and to compare and to contrast what think full really means and what think less is. Before we leave today, we're going to have a pretty good idea scripturally what we can be thankful for and then also uh, some descriptions of what a think less person looks like. A thankful person is usually someone, it comes natural to most of us when we receive a gift, when we receive something from someone to, to simply say thanks or, or, or to, to respond in some measure uh, according to the gift that, that was given to us. Uh, I say, and I think we have this in your notes today, is that the expectation when someone has shared something with us of, of a considerable value, that the recipient of that responds and and this could be, you know, different ways, various ways of doing this, whether it's, you know, saying the words, thank you, maybe it is uh, writing a note of things and filling out a note card or something and letting someone know. Maybe it's a repayment of, of sorts with, with some other activity. Uh, we find ourselves, you know, if somebody were to give me a dollar, I would be thankful, but I'm probably not going to sit here and thank you, you know, for, you know, give me a dollar. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to go buy, you know, a pack of gum or something and then, and then move on from there. But it is difficult to express the difference in my thank you for somebody that gives me one dollar or that gives me like a thousand dollars. So I thought we would do an experiment today. Can you give me all right? My wife says she can't hear you. Marcia, go there and turn you on. Alright? There's a difference. So I thought we would experiment and I thought, well, let's just see for me if it would be different in my thankfulness today. I'd like for somebody to come up and give me a dollar. I'd like for somebody to come up and give me a hundred dollars. I'd like for somebody else to come up and give me ten grand. Alright? So let's just experiment with that for a little bit and, uh, and see how it works out. See, my thankfulness will be different according to the size of the gift. You can start at any time. <laughs> You thought I was kidding, didn't you? Yeah. All right. No, thank you. That, that means a lot. I appreciate that. All right. What do we got on? Get out. I don't know. I'm afraid I'm going to blow my nose with that chair coming up here. So, okay. Anybody else got 10? Now we're going, now we're going to $10. Let's see if it changes if you give me 10 bucks. No? No? There's, there's a lot of not, not caring for the bathroom.
Let's see if there's a difference. Yeah, see, there's just a difference. You know, there, there's a, a measure of gift, you know, that somebody says, hey, I want to give something to you. I want to I pour out here. This is what I got. And my thankfulness might be different according to that. But it's, here's the trick. It's when something has been given, something has been shared, it's our response that gives you an idea of how thankful we really are. I'm thankful for Joe Herbert. Not just because he gave me a dollar, but because I know that it took a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice for him to make a dollar and then to stand up in front of people and give me a dollar. So I'm going to keep Because <laughs> I don't want him to feel bad. <laughs> but when you're full of thanks, many years ago, uh, was it Gary Chapman or Steve, Steve Chapman is the singer? Gary Chapman is the author, right? He wrote a book called The Love Languages, and he talked about a love tank or love bank. What was it? Love tank, right? And the love tank is when you do acts of kindness or you say words of affirmation or you perform acts of service, things like that. What you're doing is you're building love into the love tank. And eventually love is just overflowing and overflowing and overflowing. Thanksgiving happens in a similar fashion that some people, they give to you and they share things with you. Before you know it, you're overflowing with thankfulness. And, and there's a fullness that comes inside. But we are compelled because of that to respond. And in your fill in the blanks today, this is, this is the key. Our response is something that has been given of great value, or something that has been shared with us, despite whether we deserve it or not, is an indicator of how full of things we are. So to be a thankful person, we have to realize that something has been shared with us and that we are to respond. When we gather together for Sunday morning and we start singing some songs and the band starts playing and we start lifting up our voices unto the Lord, it is a collective opportunity. It's an opportunity for our collective body to come together and to say thank you for what God has done. And so we come together for individually and, and I may send the text today to Judd and say, hey man, thanks for that dollar. Man, that's a really cool thing. I appreciate it. Thanks for being a part. I might not. Well, I'm saying I'm <laughs> But uh, so that's, you know, that's the way that is. But when we come together in the Lord's house and, and in His name, we start singing songs. We, this is, we're singing, we're preaching, we're testifying, we're, we're, we're giving of our tithes and our offerings. We're, we're performing acts of service because what? Because God is pouring, pouring, pouring out blessing to us. And that thankfulness just keeps welling up, welling up. And then all, all of a sudden it's overflowing. That's what faithfulness looks like. And as the people of God, we understand how God continues to pour out to us. He gives us two reasons. The song writer is specifically gives us two reasons why we should be thankful. Write them in your blanks today. Here's the two reasons. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His love endures forever. You're still going to go back and face deadlines tomorrow. You're still going to go back and, and battle traffic in the morning. You're, you're still going to have all the other issues that you had last week. You're still going to have them this week. But guess what? He is good and his love endures forever. And that should make you thankful. Because he is good and his love endures forever, that should fill you up to overflowing of thanksgiving to where I'm so appreciative and I'm so full of gratitude for what God has done. Paul even builds on that. But the Apostle Paul chimes in and says he has demonstrated this never-ending love by giving us his son, Jesus. And then while we were yet sinners, what did he do for us? Died for us. John, the Apostle John echoes that with God's love. We know love because of what he's given to us. We love because he first loved us. And so we understand, we begin to grasp a little bit of the thankfulness of, of what we should be because God is faithful and because God is loving and because God keeps pouring out blessing upon blessing. We can be thankful to him no matter what, despite the circumstances. The Bible gives us also the, the answers to the questions as to when we should be thankful and, and what we should be thankful for. Paul writes to the Ephesians, he said, always giving thanks for all things. Always giving thanks. That answers the when question. The what question is all things. Are you kidding me? Do you know what I'm going through right now? Or do you, do you even have a glimpse of the pressure that I'm dealing with right now? Do you know what the doctor just told me last week? I'm supposed to be thankful for that? No, it's not what it says. He says, always giving things. For all things and everything, we are to give things. Why? Because He is good. And His love endures forever. Am I thankful that I 
wife have loved ones die from cancer? No. Am I thankful for the cancer? No. Am I thankful for the affliction, for the disease, for the trial, for the tribulation, for the struggle, for the pain that goes through it? No. But I'm thankful that in that circumstance, God was good in his love and mercy. I'm thankful that in the deepest, darkest, most trying circumstances in our life, He is good. His love endures forever. As believers, that's got to be enough for us. Because there's no promise of sunshine and rain us when we become children of God. There's no promise that you're going to be healthy and wealthy all the days of your life. There's no promise of any good thing in this life. All the promises are for what happens in the forever. And we can trust God that He is good today because He was good yesterday. It's a day and forevermore. And He's faithful. And He's trustworthy. And because He is all those things and that His love will endure forever, I can give thanks to Him today and that's enough. I remember a story Billy was telling me about. He had the opportunity to speak at a funeral service here in town a few years ago. And the funeral was for a teenage boy. And um, it was a very difficult thing. It was a very hard uh, disease, and, and the, the, the young man passed away. And uh, they gathered over here at First Baptist Winchester, and there was a, a great uh, celebration of life, a great memory, and, and difficulty, and, and a grieving time. The parents of the family were all weeping and, and wailing over the loss of this young man. And, and God took him too soon, or it, it wasn't his time, and there was a lot of uncertainty about it. The different Speakers kept coming up and they kept saying that, you know, he was just in the prime of his life and, and he had all the world in front of him and everything seemed to be going his way. And when he got sick, it was just such a difficult time. And everyone in the house was grieving. And one wise old black pastor came up. And he took the, the pulpit and Billy said he grabbed it by both hands and he just shook his head for a little bit. He had this old gravelly voice. And he started his message with this. God is always right. God is always right. And Billy said for five minutes, that wise old pastor spoke the same words over and over and over again as if the people of God, the children of God, in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their hanging on by an emotional thread, trying to teeter totter between the despair and the hopelessness, now they're getting to hear over and over and over the wisdom of a time-honored message. God is always right. They need to hear it. Just like we need to hear today, God is always good. And His love endures forever. You might need to hear that today because it's thankful to give, or it's difficult to be thankful to the circumstances you find yourself in today. It's difficult to be thankful because it doesn't seem like all the good stuff is coming your way. It seems like God is absent. It seems like God is ignorant. It seems like God doesn't know. It seems like God doesn't care. And He's far and far off. But oh, that we would come back to the scriptures today and hear that He's always right. And that he's, always, he's always good. And His love endures forever. You're not out of His sight. You're not beyond His control. So why does it hurt? Why is it so heavy? Why is the burden so great today? <laughs> I wish I had the time to take you to 2 Corinthians 4 when Paul said the same thing. But he counted all of this burden today as momentary light affliction. You see, Paul understood that there's an eternity that awaits us. Paul understood that there's a forever that awaits us. Is it difficult right now? Yes, but it cannot compare with the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. Paul was stoned. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was snake bit. Paul was beaten with rods and with 40 lashes. Afflictions in comparison to the eternal weight of glory. I've counseled many people with this before and, and talked to them because it seems like they we come in and, and, and most of the time in counseling we've got everything out of whack and everything's just so heavy and everything is just so right here, right, right in front of our faces, and we just we have a hard time getting away from it. And, and 
And so I, I, I want to just tell him, just hang on just a second. Are all these problems, are they just like right now? Or are they going to be with you forever? Let's consider just for a minute that your right now is this tiny little speck. This is your entire life. And eternity stretches out miles and miles and miles away. This speck in comparison to that eternity. You see, we lose our focus. We get, we get all of our perspective off. We get it off the eternal. We get it on the, the temporary. We get so burdened and so wrapped up in this. How in the world can we be faithful when things are hard? Turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me today to, to the letter of Colossians. Colossians, if you're unfamiliar with the New Testament, might take you a little while to find it. So go to the table of contents if you need to. But it's right in the middle of the New Testament. A short letter, it's only four chapters long. Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to be. And I'm going to ask when you find it, if you would stand with me, please. We're going to read these verses together. Or I'll read it out loud and you can follow along with me. How do we be thankful in times of this hard? In Colossians chapter 3, we begin verse 15. Paul writes these words. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Lord God, this is Your word today. May it be a lamp to our feet and a light of understanding to our path. May You alone be praised today for Your goodness and Your love. In Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. How do we be thankful? How do we have thankful hearts before the Lord? How do we have a heart that continues to be overwhelmed with, with things and with the blessings of God? It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. The peace is important because we have to realize that before there was peace, there was what? There was war. There was strife. There was rebellion. There was uh, an enmity is, is, is what it says in one translation. Enmity between you and God. There was a rebellion from you to God. And, and there was war against us. So what does it mean to let the peace of Christ rule in your heart? Peace, it says in Romans 5, comes through. We are justified because of our faith. We receive grace upon grace and we're justified by our faith. And we realize that once we've been justified, that we now have the righteousness of Christ in us. We now have the peace of Christ in us. No more war against God. No more struggle in that way. We now have peace with Him. When that peace of Christ begins to rule in your hearts, uh -huh. be thankful. Be thankful that you're not at war with God anymore because guess who wins the war with God? God always wins. So we should be thankful. In verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you with all wisdom. So when this wisdom, when the peace of God is in us, and the word of God is within us, there's wisdom and we can teach and admonish, it says, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with what else in our hearts? Thankfulness in our hearts to God. What is in our hearts for the thankful person? The peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and thankfulness in our hearts. You find somebody that is so consumed with hatred or bitterness or anger or anxiety or fear or depression. They have none of these things. The peace of Christ is not there. The word of Christ is not dwelling in you. That's why our biblical counseling ministry is so vital to our ministry and to you. Because it's sometimes we, you need somebody to put the word of Christ to remind you what he says. To remind you how to live. To remind you how to be to, to be active and to, to learn from Him. To sing with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving in our hearts. Many of you will see that I don't sing. <laughs> I don't sing. I don't have a good voice. But I don't see anywhere in chapter 3, I don't see anywhere in Paul's writings where he says, sing with a beautiful voice. He doesn't say sing with a strong voice. He says sing with thankfulness. So you can lift up your voice in thanksgiving to God because of what He has done for you. Amen. Because He is good. 
and His love endures forever. Because the peace of Christ is in you, because the Word of Christ is in you, no matter what the circumstances are, it says we can be thankful. So whatever you do, He says, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Making sure that we give thanks to Him. We would always tell our children, somebody gives you something, to say thank you. Oh, that we would not be a forgetful people. Oh, that we would not be one of those who, when our needs are met, we're good, we're satisfied. But when they're not, we run away. Out of the fullness, out of the blessing, out of the fullness of God flows thanksgiving. But like Billy said today, it's so easy to get distracted by the things that we don't have to do. It's so easy to get distracted by the things that we think we should have, but we just don't get. And so we get frustrated. We get afraid. We become depressed. We get angry. But thankful people tend to be more selfless in their, in their perspective towards things. I read this quote this week. It says, when we are thankful, our focus moves off of selfish desires and off the pain of our current circumstances. Thankful people are looking to God. Thankful people, no matter what is happening all around us, thankful people see God in the midst of that. Thankful people know and remember that God is good and His love endures forever. And even though it may hurt right now, and even though it may be difficult right now, these are momentary light afflictions. And I can be thankful to God because He has something better for me. Maybe not today, and maybe not tomorrow, and maybe not for the rest of your life. You may never be healthy or wealthy like some people promise you. You may never be famous. You may never have it all together. You may never ever be whole the way you want to be whole. But he is good. He is righteous. It is love endures forever. We must trust him in that. That's a thankful person. What is a think less person? It's like a think less person. We're in our society today, we're, we're quick to say please and give me a lot, but we're slow to say thank you. And there's four types of thankless people that I want to show you in the scriptures today. Turn to Luke chapter 11 if you would first. Actually, that's Luke chapter 17. Our first word today is forgetful. Think less person is forgetful. And I'm going to show you this. It may be a familiar story with you, but the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. Turn those pages. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. In verse 11, we pick up this story. It says, Now on its way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village in verse 12, ten men who had leprosy met him. And they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Verse 14 says, when Jesus saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And interestingly enough, the writer says, and he was a Samaritan. Interesting why? <laughs> because it seemed like all the Jewish people were the, where the presence of God was now in their midst throughout all of their history. There had been time and time and time again where they had forgotten him. They've chosen to worship another God. When things were good, they were with him. When things weren't, they abandoned him. And Luke says he was a Samaritan. You've heard of the good Samaritan? This is the healed Samaritan. In verse 17, Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to the, he said to the Samaritan, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. When your greatest needs are met, it's easy to take for granted or forget how God has brought you through the most difficult circumstances in your life. It's difficult to see God's faithfulness when you are well 
and you are satisfied and everything's going your way. That's like the song we've been singing this morning. When the sun is shining down on me and the world's all as it should be. Yeah, blessed be your name, God, you're pretty awesome. But on the road marked with suffering, and there's pain in the offering. How do you say that now? How do you bless him now? How do you thank him now? And as you read throughout Israel's history, you just see time and time and time again, Israel straying from the God that has saved them, that has rescued them from bondage. And it's easy to look and to shake our finger at those Israelites and go, you're crazy people. What is the matter with you? You were trapped there on the edge of the sea and Pharaoh's army was coming up behind you. And God opened the sea and let you walk through on dry ground and then moved the sea back over the hole of the, the, the Egyptian army and killed them all. And he saved you. He rescued you from bondage. And then he rescued you from certain death at the hands of Pharaoh and the people of God right there in the midst on the, on the shore of, of the sea that began to praise God. Check it out in Exodus 15. They began to, to, to rejoice in all that God had promised them that he was actually doing. What a beautiful day that was. I'm sure while pieces of armor and, and chariots and, and spear handles and many even bodies were floating to the top of the surface of the water, they're standing right there in the midst of God's presence, praising Him for what He'd done, thanking Him for deliverance. And then five days later, they were hungry <laughs> and they were thirsty. And they began to complain against God. And some of them in their midst had forgotten just a few days ago what God had done. They had so taken for granted the faithfulness that God was five days ago. And now they're hungry and they're thirsty and they're ready to turn around and go back into Egyptian bondage in order to have the food that they liked. <laughs> in order to have the drink that they liked. Willing to forsake the rescue of God for the pitiful offering in their temporal life. And at the end of Moses' life, as he's wrapping up uh, his, his journey on this earth, he writes in Deuteronomy 6, and Deuteronomy is like a, a wrap-up of, of the law, a reminder for, for Israel. And he's, he's giving these memoirs of sorts, and he says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, Wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you are when you eat and you're satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord. A forgetful person in times like this is a thankless person. Oh yeah, it's easy to be thankful when you've eaten and you're satisfied. It's hard to be thankful the next day. Because we forget. We get going on our own selves. We get going in our own, own ways. And really it's a sign of disrespect and dishonor. Of how faithful God has been. How much he's poured out himself to us. And then we trust. Where is he now? We use with God the phrase that we throw around here. What have you done for me lately? Yeah, I was thankful the other day when you provided that. But Lord, what have you done for me today? We tend to expect miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. But God's hand is faithful every single day. Why? Because He is good. And His love endures forever. The second thankless person is a prideful person. A prideful person. We see in 2 Timothy 3, Paul writes, There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and many other descriptions. But it finally says, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And I'll just say this for you today. The prideful person has removed God from the throne and has put themselves there in his place. That's what pride looks like. It's moving God off the throne and you ascending to that height of number one. And when you're number one, there's nobody else that's worthy of your thanksgiving. You have put yourself on the pedestal. You have exalted yourself above all others, and you look like this person on the screen. Ungrateful. Lover of pleasure, lover of self, more than lover of God. Pride 
the root to all sin creeps in even in the thankful person and makes us forget who God is and what he's done. The third is a rebellious person. And we see in Romans chapter 1 that although they knew God, who's the they? These are the unrighteous. These are the ones who have suppressed the truth. These are the ones that have heard the truth. They have known God. They've had an experience with God. They are hardwired to know his creation and to worship him. But it says even though they know it, they neither glorify him as God nor give thanks to him. And the end result is their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And eventually the text says that God gave them over. The wrath of God, it says in verse 18, is being revealed upon all the unrighteous ones. Why? Because they forgot him. They would not glorify him. They would not give thanks to him. They rebelled against him, wanting their own way. Their thinking led them to foolishness. And their hearts were darkened. The last one is the conditional response. We've already talked about this a little bit. If the condition is right and the gift is acceptable, then I'll say thank you. There's a difference between receiving a dollar and receiving a thousand dollars in our thankfulness. It just is. If you give me a dollar like you did today, I'm going to say thank you. We're going to move on. If you give me a thousand dollars, I might come over and wash your car. I might come over and trim the shrubs. I might come over and do some housework. You don't want me doing housework for you, but I'm coming. And every time I see you, I'm going to be extremely grateful for the gift that you gave me. It was a, a significant sum to me. It was something that I hold in value. It was something that I cherished. Man, it just showed up at just the right time. So thank you. But I'll ask you today, would you rather me pay your grocery bill or your car note or your house mortgage? You have a preference, don't you? Would you rather me save your cell phone's life or your pet's life or your child's life? If it came time to rescue. But if thankfulness is conditional, and it's always conditional, is it really thankfulness? Is it really thankfulness? Or is it quick appreciation because you satisfied something that I wanted? All of these, the forgetful person, the prideful person, the rebellious person, the conditional gift, they're all thankless. There's, there is such disrespect and dishonor in that. Thankfulness sees God no matter what, sees His goodness no matter the circumstances, seeing that, that His love endures forever and that I'm going to endure forever with Him. It always sees that, but it's hard. Let me, let me get you to fill these blanks in today. It's hard to be thankful when we're first angry at God. It's hard to be thankful when we're angry at God when we're blaming Him for our lot in life. It's hard to be thankful when we're bitter over our circumstances. This is not the way it's supposed to be, is it? It's not supposed to be this hard. It's hard to be thankful when we're disingenuous toward others. That word basically means we just don't care. And we prove it that we just don't care because we're just, you know, somebody shares something with you and you just take it and you move on. It's hard to be thankful when we're too busy to even notice. I don't know which one you might be today. Thankful or forgetful? Thankful or prideful? Thankful or rebellious? Thankful or conditional? But if you're here today and you're mad at God about something, you're missing out on the whole thing. If you're here today and you're bitter over your circumstances, you're bitter at someone, you're, you're frustrated with the way that things have gone, you can't be a thankful person. I'm reminded of some places in Scripture. I remember when the story about the prophet Jeremiah who's been taken away from his home and been thrown in a pit. He's been thrown in a pit and there's just nothing down there. He's thrown naked down there and he's, he's just... He's cold, and he's weakened, and he's starving to death, and he's, he's just despairing of life, and he writes a book called Lamentations. And the 
in chapter 3 of Lamentations over and over and over again. Jeremiah keeps, he keeps laying out these afflictions and this disease and these circumstances that he's, that he's involved in. He's crying out to God saying, don't you see? Don't you notice? Haven't you seen what I'm involved in? And he's, he's lamenting truly over his lot in life and his place. God, you've called me to this. You're the one that told me to tell these people to repent. And now they're mad at me and they've thrown me in this pit. And I know that you've got to see me. And I know that, that you can act, but it doesn't seem like you want to. But in verse 21, he says, yet, despite all this, yet, will I hope in the Lord. Because his mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I'm a whiner. I'm not a Jeremiah. When things don't go my way, I want to whine about it. I want to fret over it. I do. I want to get upset about it. And I'm, I want to cry about it. And crying comes out in anger. Crying comes out in frustration. Crying comes out in temper. Crying comes out in a whole, whole bunch of different ways, but very rarely am I Jeremiah. Oh, that God would give me that spirit and that heart that I would be so thankful to Him. It doesn't matter what my circumstances are, yet will I hope. Paul was in the same thing. Paul's in bondage. Paul's in prison. Paul had just been beaten. And Paul says, I have learned to be content in my lack and in my plenty. I've learned to be content when I have little and when I have much. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even Jesus on the cross, hanging in agony, had a task to accomplish. It's finished. The work has been complete. In light of all the circumstances, in light of all the things that, that come our way, I, I often wonder what is up with these miserable, hopeless, depressed Christians? What is up with that? We have God's word. We have God's salvation. We have God's promise of eternity. What is it? What is up with, with all these Christians running around and, and we're buying books left and right. We're seeing counselors left and right. We're taking medication left and right because we're miserable and we're hopeless and we're depressed. No, saints of God. The Bible says that in all things we can rejoice. In all When we struggle, where is that when we're hurting? Where is that perspective when, when everything seems to just be caving in on top of us? I'm like you. I want to scratch, I want to claw, I want to do everything I can on my own to try to make things right. It's not up to you. <laughs> Will you be thankful? No matter what. Can you leave this place today in your heart with a new perspective, an eternal perspective? That these light, momentary afflictions, these things that just aren't going your way in this life, in this world, that those things are just going to grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. The writer of Hebrews said that he says, since we were seeking a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God. Accept it with reverence and awe. Maybe you've forgotten his faithfulness. Maybe you've strayed away from, from his sovereign, right, good hand. Maybe because of your forgetfulness, maybe pridefulness has, has gotten you to a point where the pride in your life has just so forsaken God that you are on your own and now you want to blame God for it. Maybe you've been so far removed from Him, not because He's left, but because you've been chasing all the other things out there. Either because they're shiny, or they're new, or they promise you something that can never come true. What are you searching for? What are you hunting for? A thankful person overflowing with 
blessing because he knows that God is good. His love is good. Pray for me today, if you would. How do you show your thankfulness to God? How do you come before him? Do you come to church and sing some songs, but the lyric has no effect on you? Do you pray a prayer, but it feels so shallow because you've been so far removed from the Lord and you've forgotten what thankfulness looks like because you don't feel like you've received anything from Him? Whether it be in your finances or your relationships or, or your physical life, your emotional life, your spiritual life, can you say, thank you, God? I don't deserve any good thing. But you continue to pour out blessing upon blessing. And Lord, if I haven't told you in a while, I'm grateful. And I know that without you, I'm nothing. I know without you, I don't have anything. I know without you, I cannot live or breathe. I need you, God. I need your hand. I need your heart. I need your eyes. I need your ears. Hear my cry. See my plight. Rescue me. I thank you for all the other times that you have. I remember now, Lord, when you rescued me from that. I remember now when, when you saved me. I remember. And I'm thankful. May the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the giver of all good gifts, remind you today in the good times and the bad, he is good. And his love endures forever. We take that and we rejoice in that today. No matter where you are, no matter what you're in the middle of, He's good. His love and His forever. So let's respond in thankfulness and in praise. In Jesus' name, amen.